This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 471, recorded on December 8th, twenty. 17. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. It's cold this morning. It is, actually. It feels like winter, finally. Minus one Celsius yeah. this morning, about 7 a.m. Yeah. Cloudy, isn't it? There's a gray presence of the weather. Gray presence. A gray presence. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's 37 Fahrenheit, 3 Celsius here. And um, the, the wind is starting to pick up now. But this morning, uh, I went up flying and it was eerie that it was flat calm and the air was just completely still. Hmm. It was great. It was uh, totally smooth. How often do you fly? Once a week? Uh, I try to get up at least once or twice a month. Nice. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. But now we've got this high overcast rolling in and tomorrow we're supposed to get snow. Exactly. Yeah, here too. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Good. <laughs> uh, get this. It's sunny <laughs> and 45 degrees, Ooh. 7 Celsius, and get this, it snowed last night. Right. Ooh, wow, that's, that's amazing. Right. Wow. I did know that. Yeah. What, a we quarter, had, uh, quarter of an inch? Had, uh, we had, actually, it, uh, it was, I know about snow, right? You know, yeah. I lived in Buffalo for 12 years. It, um, <laughs> it was it. <laughs> the, it was just barely above, barely above freezing or about at freezing. So it was the really fluffy stuff. Uh, so we got an inch or two of accumulation, but really, really powdery. It didn't stick to the streets or any of the pavement, yeah. but it stuck to the roofs right. and it stuck to the lawns and everything else. There you go. It snowed for a couple of hours, uh, in the evening and a little bit during the night. And we woke up to, uh, <laughs> it all being white. It's mostly gone now, but um, a rare event here in Austin. So this, this doesn't beautiful. happen more than a few times. A Just year to get you in the Christmas uh, I think I, I think I think actually having an, everybody was really pretty uh, jazzed about the accumulation. <laughs> I, I, I don't think my my daughter's been here for seven years. I don't think she's ever seen anything like this. <laughs> she's seen snow come out of the sky, but not stick really. Right. Okay. I presume you don't have any snow plows or, or salt spreaders. No, or anything. hell. And they, and they uh, the uh, the elementary schools were uh, um, took a snow day today. Ah, oh Because I think, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think no, no, school buses never see on it icy roads and that kind of stuff. They got a. <laughs> yeah, they got a. That's pretty. And funny. Like, yeah, I don't think they they probably don't have anything to deal no. with this. No, in in the south, a half inch of snow, if anything sticks to the road. It just paralyzes everything. Yeah, that's yeah. true. It's hilarious. You got to get me in here so I can talk about the yes. stuff too. <laughs> oh, also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hi, yes, Kathy. in Georgia, Hello, I remember it classically. It was snowing, but it was the wet kind of snow that immediately melted on the road, and people were driving at 15 miles an hour, <laughs> and they they closed the university after this all started, so that then everybody had to drive home in this scary stuff. You know, yeah. they they would drive at 55 if it were just if it were pouring cats and dogs raining, sure. but this stuff, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> anyway, right now here it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit, minus one Celsius, totally blue sky, sunny, wonderful day. Nice. Cool. Do you have snow on the ground, Kathy? Have you had snow yet? We had just a little bit of snow on the ground uh, yesterday, but not even as much as it sounds like you had. But that's it. Pretty late in the season for not having much snow. True. Yeah. Yeah, and here, uh, starting tomorrow, it's going to go back up highs in the 60s for the next two weeks. Right. I mean, it's it's definitely Austin winter, finally, yeah. okay? But this uh, snow thing was unusual. Today, we're going to talk about dengue. But before we do, uh, Kathy, tell us about ASV. Well, as you recall, it's about this time of year when I start to remind people that if they haven't already renewed their membership to ASV, they should do that because 
the abstract deadline for the 2018 meeting is coming right up. The abstract deadline is February 1st. And if you're a student or postdoc and you want to apply for a travel award, you need to have your membership up to date. And if you're sub- submitting an abstract, you need to have a sponsor whose membership is up to date. So really, everybody should get their membership up to date. If you're not yet a member, the policy for membership changed. You no longer have to get a letter of recommendation from an ASV member. You simply need to upload a biosketch or CV. And if you're a student, you just uh, get a form signed by somebody in authority that can verify that you're a student or postdoc and you're not uh, some faculty member trying to get in at the student rate. (laughs) Uh, And so... uh, now is a good time to do that so that in January you can think about the content of your abstract and be ready to get it in on time February 1st. The ASV meeting w- will be in uh, July, the 14th to the 18th at the University of Maryland. And some people are already getting their posters. Uh, we just got some of them here on campus today. And then you can also check out the program on the website. You can get to it from the ASV site, which is asv.org, or the site for the meeting itself is asv2018.umd.edu. So that's .umd for University of Maryland.edu. So check out the program. There are uh, a lot of good satellite meetings that are going to happen before the meeting and then the regular plenary sessions. And the keynote speaker is someone that you know, and that is going to be Vincent Racaniello. Wow. So, yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, That's cool. Are you sitting in the presence Vincent? of greatness? <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Holy cow. Kathy, when you said satellite meetings, a, a weird image just went through my mind. Like the first satellite ever launched looked just like a virus. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sputnik. Sputnik. Mm-hmm. You know, with the little antennae sticking off it, like the little feet. Adenovirus. Yeah. Looked like an adenovirus. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, Look except, at that. It was, except it was spherical, but other than that, you know. You have a favorite virus? <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I'll send you okay. the picture of the necklace I'm wearing today. <laughs> Got Sputnik on it? Yeah, it's the adenovirus. Yeah. All right, ASV Maryland, not far. Not far from here, right? For not How far, far is... Uh, College Park, Maryland. So from New York City, it's a four-hour drive. Uh, right. It's a long way. Well, from my house, it'll be two hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the way you drive. Yeah. I'm going to drive. <laughs> I am going to drive. That way we can avoid uh, the TSA. I will probably fly down and may or may not avoid the TSA in so doing. <laughs> mm. There, by the way, there's a there is an absolutely wonderful small airport right across the street from the University of Maryland that is a complete pain in the tuchus to fly into, and I probably won't be able to go in there because <laughs> hmm. so they've got that security zone that Bush put around Washington D.C. That you know, so you have to you have to get like a a clear up a whole clearance process and fingerprinted and everything in order to um, wow. uh, to be allowed to fly into that particular airport. It's the oldest. Um, it is the oldest uh, continuously operating airfield in the world. Neat. Oh. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yes, the Wright brothers taught people how to fly there. Uh, uh, Whoa, my goodness. Nice. Anyway. Hey, go to ASV 2018. All right, t- today is dengue, and in particular, dengvaxia. Yes. And they shouldn't have called it denvaxia. No, just kidding. <laughs> Dengvaxia is uh, a vaccine that's been in the news the past week. Not in a good way. No, unfortunately. And and uh, Rich sent a couple of articles to us early in the week, and and I said, let's talk about it Friday. So Dengvaxia is a vaccine. We'll talk about it in detail in a moment. Produced by Sanofi, and uh, they released a... a um, what is it? An update. An update. It's called Sanofi Updates Informa- Information on Dengue Vaccine. It's on the Sanofi website. Based on up to six years of clinical data, the new analysis evaluated long-term safety and efficacy of dengue vaccine in people who had been infected with dengue prior to vaccination and those who had not. The analysis confirmed that dengue vaccine provides persistent protective benefit against dengue fever. And they had a typo in their release. Yes. <laughs> 
in those who had prior infection. For those not previously infected by the virus, however, the analysis found that in the longer term, more cases of severe disease could occur following vaccination upon a subsequent dengue infection. So now they are proposing that national regulatory agencies update the prescribing information requesting that healthcare professionals assess the likelihood of prior dengue infection in an individual before vaccinating. Vaccination should only be recommended when the benefits outweigh the risks in countries with high burden of dengue. For those who have not been infected previously with dengue virus, vaccination should not be recommended. And the Philippines has withdrawn the use of uh, the vaccine. And Brazil, I understand, is now going to just vaccinate kids over 15. So let's talk about this. And by the way, uh, Sanofi's stock price dropped has dropped um about three dollars a share from uh, forty five sixty four to forty three seventeen in the the week since this came out. So that does appear to have affected them. Mm. And you mentioned some other bad news for them too, right, Alan? They, yes, they also so coincident with this. Um, in fact, I think it was it was also this week, um, or maybe it was just last week. They ended a phase three trial um, for a C diff vaccine that they were working on and um mm. uh not ended in a good way either so mm. that's also hurting them now San- sanofi is a huge company they make the majority of the or i don't know if it's a majority but they make more flu vaccine than anybody else um so if you get a flu shot you've got pretty good odds of getting a sanofi shot they've got a huge facility in um swiss water pennsylvania which is their main U.S. plant. They have other plants around the world. So this is this is a major vac- vaccine manufacturer. It's not like these are their only couple of products, but um, but these were uh, pretty pretty big deals, and they had poured an enormous amount of money into both of these things. Yep. Yeah, I'm trying to find the number of billion. I think it's one kind of- one point eight billion for Dengvaxia. Yeah, yeah it's two billion. Yeah, Whew. it's a lot of money. Yeah. Well, um, in an article by Sidrap, it said they said this was predicted. This outcome was predicted two years ago by Scott Halstead. Do you know Scott Halstead? Very well. He's a well-known dengue flavi virologist. Right? He is worked for the Rockefeller Foundation for many years. He's now at uh, U.S. Uh, Uniform Services Health Sciences. That's University. right. And this year he got the Walter Rito Medal from the American Society yeah. for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. So we're very proud of him. So he said, and SIDRAP is the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Uh, it's based at the University of Minnesota. Interesting. Yes. Right. So the title of their article is Sanofi restricts dengue vaccine but downplays antibody enhancement. Mm. Okay. And so Scott House that is quoted in this article quote Sanofi has created a god awful mess and we're going to have to slog along. End quote. Which I think is kind of harsh because I don't think they created this mess i Just think that's really out. harsh <laughs> yeah I, yeah I, I mean a little perspective here to, and we're going to talk extensively about uh, this is the main topic for the episode for those of you who are wondering when we're going to get to that um <laughs> so so this is going to be the whole episode i hope you want to hear about it and this is a really really tough thing to do and there's a reason that we didn't have a dengue vaccine i mean we've known about this virus for decades and we've known it's serious and it's just um, for a company to commit to this and vaccines, especially vaccines targeting a disease that predominantly affects globally poor people, right, um, is a huge, huge risk. Um, and you know, you're you're betting that you're going to be able to sell enough doses of this to probably governments in tropical countries, which are not flushed with funds. Um, well, they're to, all in Swiss bank accounts. You know, right, to to be able to pay off your development costs for what turns out to be a really hard vaccine to develop. And they committed to this, and they've worked on it for years, and they finally got it to this point. Um, and, uh, you know, this was certainly not something where they they definitely could have seen this coming. I mean, yes, Scott predicted it, but... If he'd been wrong, I'm sure he wouldn't be writing a, an article saying, hey, I was wrong. Instead, he turns out to have correctly called this. And so he's writing and I told you so uh, or it's, uh, making making quotes to that effect. And um, but 
but yeah, I, I think we need to cut them a little bit of slack on this. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, am I correct that it's Halstead's lab that's uh, responsible for this alternative dengue vaccine, the attenuated one, or have I got that mixed up? I don't think so. I, I think he's not doing any lab work. Correct. Any longer. Okay. So what lab uh, there? Oh, so that one, which we'll talk about, that is out of NIH. Right. Uh, that's uh, reference 19 on on Scott Holstead's article, which is okay. uh, uh, live attenuated. We talked about that on a previous TWIV. Yes, I know. And I, I was looking for that TWIV, and I couldn't find it. And and someone, Kathy, probably found it. I couldn't find it either. Boy, I have to fix the uh, search function. I just did Google searching. And you got I searched uh, what I do. Yes. So TWIV 319 and TWIV 370. Well, the 370 was Is the a, end of the yeah. year show. So it's 319. And, three, and 319 was about Dengvaxi, I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Okay. We but I trials. know we did well, one that, on this other vaccine. Well, I Googled Dengvaxia and TWIV. So you can Google something else and twiv i googled Deng- right. De- dengue and twiv and i tried it mm-hmm. four different Here. ways and i couldn't i couldn't find it here it is 384 uh-huh. twiv 384 agent 003 a view to a fish kill there you go <laughs> okay uh, new vaccines to prevent dengue infections including a virus challenge model that's it i was looking for yes. two because <laughs> i knew i knew about this and the only way i would know about it is because of twiv <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so this knew, paper, yeah. it's it's linked in the show notes. What a nice uh, thing to have the link. <laughs> of course, yes. it is published, JID, and the, and the uh, lab is, uh, where is it? Well, show more, show, author notes, <laughs> Stephen Whitehead. And Anna Durbin is the first author, and Stephen Whitehead is the last author. And let's we have to scroll all the way to the bottom to get the affiliations. Yeah, maybe. Here we go. Well, it's NIAID. Uh, so, uh, is that good enough, uh, Rich? Yep, yep, yep. That okay. uh, gives us the episode, the lab, the whole thing. Yeah, we'll talk about that TV003 in a bit. All right, Denvaxia. Now, um, dengue virus. And by the way, Scott Halstead wrote an article in Vaccine. It was just published. Uh, recently, and um, l- late this year, and it's called Denvaxia Sensitizes Seronegatives to Vaccine-Enhanced Disease Regardless of Age. Even you, Dixon, will be sensitized, although you would probably be infected already at your age. I thought you said I was insensitive. <laughs> <laughs> no, did I say that? <laughs> you might have. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I mean, I didn't mean to. All right, dengue virus, flavivirus, plus stranded RNA, about 11 KB, enveloped, uh, with the glycoproteins in the envelope, and those are important for uh, the issuance of neutralizing antibodies. <laughs> um, four serotypes. Mosquito transmitted, right, by Aedes aegypti. Yep. And um, there have been small outbreaks in Florida and Texas, but that's about it. Mo- and then you can get imported cases in the U.S., but there, wherever Aedes aegypti is, there's a lot of dengue. Yep. And so four serotypes, you get infected with one serotype, you develop immunity to that serotype. But if you get reinfected with a different serotype, um, you make antibodies to the heterologous serotype. Those do not neutralize the virus, and they can bind to it and allow it to infect cells that are not normally infected with FC receptors, and that leads to antibody-dependent enhancement. You get hemorrhage and shock, severe, serious uh, dengue disease requiring hospitalization. Which is why it's called dengue hemorrhagic fever. Yeah. Now, after now this, the- this mechanism that you've just described is fairly well demonstrated in various models, but um, it we're not absolutely certain that that's exactly how it works, right? I think it's not proven in people. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to do. We do know they, that, that. Yeah, the, I mean, the, observ- the observation going back years is that a second infection exactly. with dengue with yeah. a different serotype is it is likely, or or you More have like, a high probability of getting yeah. a much worse yeah. infection. And then mechanistically, we've got this insight that yeah. it appears that the, you've got non neutralizing antibodies that come out and and aid the infection. So if if you get infected with any of the strains, yes. do you get breakbone fever, or is it only one or two strains that give? No, you I, that? I think they all do breakbone. You know, uh, okay. muscle and aches, it, joint pain, hemorrhage, conjunctivitis, uh, rash. Right. Yeah. First. Whereas a, a first a first infection in a naive 
individual is more is more likely to be milder though you may not get the mm. yeah. the full break bone fever like oh gosh right. my bones are breaking my muscles hurt so badly right. but um, it, but it is possible to get the it pretty is severe, yeah, severe it is. infection the first time because we've got the one in ten thousand ish right the first infections well, and then one in a hundred for the second I used to direct the uh, medical elective in the tropics fourth year elective and yeah. two medical students at various totally different years apart both ended up in our hospital suffering from serious break bones. yeah. Very serious. Now, remember, Nina Martin, who was on TWIV, right. talked about her primary dengue infection. Right. And mm -hmm. she said she never recovered. She always had other mm -hmm. issues. Exactly. You know? exactly. So that's where we want to have a vaccine. This is a nasty infection. And so, yeah. and so even at first blush, making a vaccine is tricky. Problematic. Because yeah. you have to mm. try and ensure that you get a good uh, – with a good – uh, response to all four serotypes. You can't just go in and do one and then do another later on That's because right. you're That's asking right. for trouble. That's right. All right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And you can't, if you go in and you get, um, you know, good immunity to three of the four serotypes and not to one of them with your vaccine, then that patient goes out and gets infected with that fourth serotype they're much more likely to get the more serious disease, and so you've made things potentially worse. Right, right. so it's you'd really tricky. You'd think with, yeah. an, with a virus that's uh, four strains of the same backbone-type virus that you could find some commonality in all of them that you could use for a vaccine to knock them all out at once, but that hasn't happened, has it? Mm -mm. Well, the, the, the TV003, the attenuated vaccine, uh, takes advantage of things like that. We'll get to that. Okay. Right. So Dengvaxia... <laughs> Starts with the yellow fever vaccine. Right. 17D made by Max Tyler here in New York City in the 30s and 40s. By serial right? passage. Passaged many times, hundreds of times in chick embryos. And attenuate uses the yellow fever vaccine, made a DNA copy of it, and you substitute the glycoprotein, the, the two, the PRM and the E proteins of the virus, which are in the envelope. You substitute, you take out the yellow fever and you put in the dengue ones. So yellow fever is yet another flavivirus. And so in terms of its genetic map, it looks uh, essentially indistinguishable. You know, if you draw a, sort of a cartoon block map, it looks essentially indistinguishable from dengue. So it seems like a, it is genetically or engineering-wise a very straightforward issue just to replace its envelope proteins, M and E, the ones that show up on the surface of the virus, uh, with the dengue virus, and you make four different guys, one with each of the dengue serotypes in it. But now the rest of the virus, which is most of it, and most of these are what they call non-structural proteins. These are proteins that are used in replication, like polymerase and protease and stuff that don't show up uh, in the envelope. Uh, but uh, uh, all of those in Dengvaxia are from yellow fever not from dengue. The only dengue uh, proteins are the surface proteins, M and E, not even the capsid protein. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, the yellow fever virus gave flaviviruses its name because it, sure. flavi means yellow. Yeah, viruses. jaundiced. There you go. And you had yellow fever, right? Yes, indeed. And yellow in Latin is flavi. flavus. We used to flavus. have it right here in New York. What, yellow fever, yeah. Yep. It was in Philadelphia, too. Amazing. Yeah. So yeah, that's, also, that's actually the origin of um, well, that and some other diseases are the origin of the tradition of city folks going out to the countryside in the summer. Really? <laughs> and having their summer homes um, was that you got out of the city where all the diseases were. Right. And, um, you know, you were less likely to get yellow fever if you were privileged enough to have a summer home up in the up in the hills. Right. Mm. It's also uh, worthwhile uh, pointing out that this approach of making these recombinant viruses with uh, – uh, yellow fever that make uh, dengue is a perfectly logical approach. Totally. Um, yes. the, yeah. the thinking, the think, because you know one of the prominent re immune responses you get if you're infected with dengue, one of the wa ways to measure whether you've been in infected is whether you make antibodies, and the antibodies that you raise are predominantly to uh, the envelope proteins, which makes ser sense. Those are the dominant. Uh, proteins on, on the surface of the virus. So the thinking is that if you can raise an immune response 
uh, that consists of an antibody response to the surface proteins, you ought to be fine. And it also, if you make this recombinant virus, it um, gets around some of the problems involved in making attenuated vaccines like reversion to virulence and that kind of stuff because this recombinant virus sh- uh, uh, shouldn't have those problems. So conceptually, it's, it, it's a fine idea. Yeah. At the time, it sounded great it's only in hindsight that we yeah it's it sounded it. like a, it <laughs> sounded like a great approach and um as we'll i, I think we're going to talk about the clinical trials shortly um they they proceeded with caution yeah. so what are we missing that we could have done some other intermediate experiments on first to make sure that it works before you try it in humans well no this is a really, well this is a the, the problem thing. is Mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. Exactly. One. Exactly. Yeah. Number two, you know, yeah, you have to. Ultimately, you have to. You have to do it in humans, and ultimately, uh, you know, you, there's effects where that are small enough, so and mm. take long enough, yeah, that's so it. that you can't really find out exactly what's going on until you do a, a boatload of people and wait a long time. Yeah. That's the bottom line. That that it was so, licensed after a year in the phase three, and then five years later, the data came out that said, "Whoops, something's sure. wrong here." And this sure. whole time, you know, this is something this antibody dependent enhancement slash severe dengue, whatever you want to you know refer to this as, was the central or or one of the central foci of of these studies was looking for this. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't like they didn't see this coming. Um, so there, there were a lot of, of efforts to try to detect that in the data, um, and moving into clinical trials, you know, the, the safety trial, okay, is anybody getting hurt by this vaccine? And then you go to phase two, you expand it a little bit and, uh, phase three trials, they're, they're dealing with tens of thousands of, (laughs) of patients receiving this vaccine because you, um, in a, in a, vector-borne disease like this, um, you don't know who's going to get exposed. Right. So in order to do the trial, you vaccinate That's a huge it. population of people. That's it. And then you follow up and see, are, are the rates of dengue infection in this group different from in this group? And how about severe disease? And you're depending upon outbreaks. And they're sporadic. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. They're sporadic, so you don't really know where to That's look true. first. They vary from year to year. They're different they serotypes or different sequences. So we talked about these trials, but just to review, there were there was a big one in Latin American countries. There was a big one in Asia. The Latin America one, for example, uh, 20,869 children between 9 and 16 wow. <laughs> years of age. They got three doses uh, at 0, 6, and 12 months, blinded. They were then followed for 25 months. Um, and, of course, there was a placebo and a vaccine arm. And the primary outcome was vaccine efficacy against symptomatic virologically confirmed dengue more than 28 days after the third injection. And after the first year, uh, if they found that the, the vaccine was efficacious, um, 50%, 42%, 74%, and 77% for the four serotypes. So some were better than others. Some were not. So serotype 2 wasn't so great, but... Uh, they serotype could, 2 has always been a problem. No matter yeah. where you look, serotype 2 is a problem. Uh, and this led to licensure be, in, in kids over nine because that's what it was tested in. And, uh, and I believe actually in the phase two trial, they looked at um, the seroconversion for the four serotypes. Yeah. Um, so that they so going into this, they, they knew that they were getting responses to all four, which is Correct. obviously so, a central question. So they were measuring neutralizing antibodies. So they got it against all four, except... The, the levels of neutralizing antibodies differed for each serotype, but you did get neutralizing antibody. That's an important point. Uh, neutralizing antibody, the way that's defined is you got uh, ser- uh, antibodies in people's serum that in an in vitro, uh, like plaque assay or something like that, will inactivate the virus. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't. The, the, a big issue here become, always is and becomes that we have to pay attention to is a uh, a tricky little phrase called correlates of protection. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is you can measure all sorts of uh, immune responses, 
but you don't necessarily know just by measuring them which one, if any of these, actually confer protection to the disease. And that's part of what a clinical trial is supposed to figure out. You measure all these things and ask whether the people are actually protected uh, from the disease, and there, then you can say something definitive, perhaps, about correlates of protection. This, by the way, is one of the main obstacles in developing an HIV vaccine, is we don't really know what the correlates of protection are. So in the case of dengue, we believe the correlates of protection would be neutralizing antibodies, and so that's what we're looking for here. Is everyone still here? Yeah. Okay. I heard a beeping, so I didn't know. Now, most of what I'm going to talk about comes from Halstead's article, which is really kind of a letter. It was published. This is interesting. It was submitted in June of this year. And these withdrawals are now happening, so he he had thought about this ahead of time. And um, so he says that now we we know that serious— so they define serious dengue as requiring hospitalization. It happened in two populations. First, vaccinated seronegative children. So these kids have never seen dengue before. You give them— the dengue vaccine. It's an infectious vaccine. Now it's like having their first dengue infection. So they go out in the wild, they get challenged by dengue, they get severe dengue because, it, well, it's the same situation, right? And the second group is the kids who, who got the placebo who were immune to one serotype. So again, it's like having your first dengue infection. They get a placebo, so they're not protected. And uh, they get a secondary, they get a infection with dengue out in the wild and they get serious disease and that's what you expect they didn't get a vaccine right that's the normal situation <clears throat> right but of course you didn't ex- you didn't want that to happen in the vaccinated seronegative children you would hope that the vaccine against all four right. serotypes would prevent that now the numbers here let's let's give them to you because they're not huge but they're still significant um so these are After the third dose, five years later, in the vaccinated group, 295 out of 20,400 children, that's 1.44%, were hospitalized with dengue infection. And during years two to four, 168 children were hospitalized, 61 of them nine years or older. In the placebo group, 106 children were hospitalized, and 60 were nine years or older when given the placebo. So, you know, 1.4%, but... um, I would just say that we're going to immunize millions and millions of kids, so that's not an acceptable number. Hey, no. You know, polio paralysis after the vaccine is one in 1.4 million, and that's not acceptable. So none of this is. And, you know, I've I've read that Sanofi is saying, well, it's not so much, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, let's see. If you're, one, if you're one of those kids or their parents, then Except that's a the lot. Rich is gone. He has lost power, he said. Lost his power. Hmm. He's on his way back, though. Must be because of the blizzard there. The in blizzard Austin. in Austin, yeah, <laughs> That's that right. did it. All right, so um, the only good news, in, in, Halstead says this, is that the seropositives who got the vaccine were moderately well protected against secondary dengue infection. And so that's why we have this current recommendation to only give the vaccine to people who've already had dengue. Over 50. And we're over 15 because as you age in these populations, it's more likely that you're going to get infected, right? Because right. you're just a, yeah, st- statistically, right? Yep. Now, he had some really interesting points, which I didn't recognize all of them, why it's really hard and why you need to go out several years. You're not going to find everything out in the first year after a dengue vaccine. <clears throat> first of all, that the, the, uh, the prevalence of monotypic dengue immunes in other words, you've been infected with den- is a function of lifetime exposure, right? Just as we've said, risk right. is lower in younger than older children. Okay, so we just said that. The sequence the sequence of serotype infections also matters. I didn't know this. Dengue 1 followed by 2 or 3 produces higher hospitalization rates than dengue 2 or 3 followed by 1. Oh, hmm. Lord. And, and in endemic areas, the sequences are always changing, you know, from season right. to season. So if the, if the sequence isn't right, the first year of your trial, you know, you're not going to get the right data. And then finally, uh, in any season of antibodies, in most of the kids match the circulating serotype, you're not going to have a lot of hospitalization. So that's another complicating factor. So year-to-year hospitalizations in the placebo group are not uniformly related to dengue infection rates. You know, depending. And there's on- also there's the confounding factor of not everybody's going to get exposed to this every year. Exactly. Sure. 
That's so, cool. and in fact, you might even speculate that kids who have reached the age of nine and have not been exposed to dengue may be living in situations where their risk is lower. Uh, Dixon, do the mosquitoes vary from year to year also? Well, they vary in, in density, that's for sure. So some years there's more bites than others? Sure, of course. So that could influence it too, right? Weather patterns. Weather patterns, yeah. Everything. Migration of people from jobs, that sort of thing. Yep. Lots of that, actually. Especially I in China. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I want to go back to the thing that uh, we said a few minutes ago, and I had <laughs> taken notes and couldn't find them at first. So the issue of if the antibodies – in a given year, match the circulating serotype, hospitalization rates will be lower. And the way I figure that is because they won't get a second infection infection of the same serotype if that's what's circulating. So yeah. that's right. the reason. Right. That. That's, okay. right. Mm-hmm. that's right. It kind of went unsaid, and I needed yes. to make that logical yeah. leap. And to Rich, get, Rich would have said it, but is he? To, to get hospitalization, you need to have a different serotype <laughs> exactly. from, from what you're immune to. Yeah. yeah. Here's an interesting series of, of points. Annual age-specific hospitalization rates during years two to four differ for these two groups. The two groups we're talking about are the uh, the vaccinated seronegatives and the and the placebo monotypic dengue immune children. Okay, for vaccinated children, the attack rates, in other words, dengue, are highest in the youngest group five to eight years. He argues, Halstead argues that the only and these are his words, the only defensible interpretation <laughs> of these data. Uh, is that this curve, the attack rate, derives from hospitalizations of vaccinated serum, seronegatives. In other words, they are monotypic immune equivalents right. after they get the vaccine. And so I, the vaccine is acting like an infection with one exactly, serum. Exactly, right. exactly. Now, I guess he didn't have access to the ser- serostatus of these kids, right, in constructing this curve, because he's saying... Well, in one of these papers, you know, the, he does he does have the uh, serology, but you don't have serology on all of the kids. Yeah, I right. think this is a way of looking at the whole trial. That's right. That's right. Without having serology on everybody, and sort of extrapolating on the little the, on the indications you get from the from the numbers you have where there is serology. So this figure with the attack rate is age at hospitalization of dengue-infected vaccinated children two to four years post-third dose. So five to eight years old, you got 90. Uh, That's average hospitalizations per 10,000, so it would be 90. Then nine to 11 years, it goes down to 60. 12 to 14, it's 20. And then 15 to 19, it's less than 10. So as you get older, you already uh, have been infected. Um, And he says that this curve looks very much like a 1981 study from Cuba in Cuban children, dengue 2 hospitalization rates in children who had been infected with dengue 1 in previous years. So in other words, you get the same kind of age distribution. Right. So he's basically he's making an epidemiological argument that the data from the Sanofi trial um, mm-hmm. look like a look like the vaccine is imitating a first infection with a single serotype of dengue. Yes. That's right. Meaning that's right. It's co- meaning it is correlating with a more severe second infection. That's right. Now, figure three is age at hospitalization of placebo children, two to four years post third dose. Okay, so now these are kids that only got a placebo; they didn't get a vaccine. It, the incidence peaks at nine to eleven years of age. So these are kids who are getting second dengue infections. Right. And he says, this is what we see in kids in Southeast Asia today, the same peak of, of uh, attack rate between nine and 11 years old. So, and, the, and those numbers then for that nine to 11 years, that's 70 per 10,000. So 0.7%. Right. right. Versus the, at the younger age group in the dengue infected vaccinated after the third dose is 90 per 10,000, which is 0.9%. Right. So, it's a little bit lower in the placebo children that are then hospitalized after yep. the second dose. Yep. Now, another point, which is very interesting, is that the hospitalization rates in kids who got the vaccine did not decline over time. So basically, they're, over the five, six-year period, the rates are, are not changing. 
So, for example, year five after the third dose, he had 411, 999, and 865 children which who were vaccinated at ages 2 to 5, 6 to 8, and 9 to 14. They were hospitalized in the Thai trial. All right, so these are kids uh, at, at who are five years out, and they're still being hospitalized. At a rate of somewhere around 2.7 down to 1.3%. And he says among the 9 to 14-year-olds, 1.3% were hospitalized during year five. He says this single-year attack rate exceeds the 1% lifetime risk of hospitalization for dengue in those born in Thailand. So that that's a substantial attack rate uh, associated mm-hmm. with the use of the vaccine. So this is all data from the trial, and that's what led to um, it being restricted. But they they do note in all these articles there have been no deaths so far associated with the use of this vaccine. So there doesn't seem to be any serious adverse events yet or, you know, dengue, serious dengue that has been fatal. So, and the use of the vaccine in people who have previous experience with dengue, people who were seropositive, yeah. is good. Yep. It, yes. uh, it reduces hospitalizations in those people. And, that, and, and since 70 or 80 percent of the people in the trial had seen dengue before, Okay, then the overall trial results before you start to pick it apart like this look good. Yes. Okay, it's not until you uh, really drill down and get to this distinction between people who were seropositive or seronegative uh, at the time that the trial started uh, that you see these differences. And structuring the trial that way, if I mean, if we're going to Monday morning quarterback this and say, oh, well, they should have done a trial where they got 20,000 kids who were dengue naive in Latin American countries and vaccinated them to, to get the, you know, to, to really get at this effect. Um, then you're adding a serology test and a rather high bar to clear for your patients in countries where dengue is endemic. Mm. So you're, you're making it harder to run the trial, which is already hard enough to run. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that there was a good way to have seen this coming. So uh, I don't, and I don't know if we got this uh, on air. Did we say how much the development of this vaccine cost? Mm. The, oh yes, I think we did. It was at 1.8 billion is the ballpark. Right. Yeah. So, so this is you can you can you know given the all of the research and the size of these trials, that's no surprise. I have a and, and in fact, the the structure of something like of a project like this in the pharma world is to try to fail it early. So yeah. when you're doing a phase one or a phase two trial, you analyze the heck out of that thing and you say, okay, why can we say this isn't working? Because we really, really don't want to go to a phase three and have it fail there because that's where you're in the billions of dollars. Yes. Um, so they, they did look in the earlier phases to try and see, well, okay, look, we're getting we're getting antibodies against all four serotypes and they're neutralizing antibodies and doing all of those types of checks and then finally going to the phase three. And as I just said, if you are doing a phase three trial in all these kids in Latin America, a huge proportion of them will have been exposed to dengue already. That's just the reality there. And so this becomes a very hard thing to detect at that level. Yeah, it would have been hard to predict because you would think if I get antibodies to all four serotypes, I should be protected yeah. against serious disease. So that begs the question, why aren't these kids protected? And yeah. so Halstead discusses the idea that what you need for protection against serious disease are cited CD8 positive T lymphocytes, not antibody. And there's some evidence for that in, in people. And the epitopes for these lymphocytes are located in non-structural dengue virus proteins, which of course are not part of dengvaxia. Those proteins come from yellow fever. yellow fever virus. And so it may be simply that uh, having used the heterologous non-structural set of non-structural proteins has caused this to occur. And again, which no one could have predicted, I think. No. Right, and, and which we still don't really know. That's a, that's a hypothesis. Yeah. Can right. we... Back up just a moment yeah, and um, sure. review briefly the impact that dengue has on endogenous populations in the tropics. Because, I mean, I'm looking at a vaccine now that's developed uh, for childhood 
exposure and disease, but we're worried about people missing days at work. And those are not children, those are adults. So if you're exposed as a child and you get an infection and you suffer a little bit and you stay home from school a little bit and then you go back and then later on as an adult, you get another infection and right. you're in the hospital. How long are you in the hospital and what is the mortality rate at that point? Because how many days of work uh, does a typical outbreak result in, in a, let's say, a heavily populated uh, region of, let's say, the subtropics or tropics like Cuba, for instance? So do you really – does it really impact the economics of the country for warranting this kind of a vaccine development? I'm certain that analysis has been done. I am too, I but I'm just begging the question now. Yeah, I don't have the numbers. Andy. <laughs> does anybody – I know we can look them up. I'm looking it up. Because um, they would have to have sat down a long time, this company, and said, you know, why are we doing this? I mean, who's? I know who's going to pay for it. Okay. So, okay. I've got global burden of dengue analysis. Um, it's a WHO It's from thing. the Lancet in oh. 2016. Because um, every year they summarize dengue. They, they, they take ProMed and they do a summary of dengue infections. Yes. So. And this is a, this is a multi-institutional whole bunch of people yeah um average of 9221 dengue deaths per year 9000 uh that's, that's worldwide worldwide that's, yeah that's deaths annually between f- 1990 and 2013 we have 40,000 people a year die from influenza uh, in this country there are according to who the symptoms are 2 to 7 days but there's a 2 to a 1 to 2 day period of critical stage where you might die right. uh, if you're not if you're not in hospital yeah. So, okay, so accounting for disability from moderate and severe acute dengue and post-dengue chronic fatigue, 566,000 years lived with disability attributable mm-hmm. to dengue in 2013. Okay, okay. And, what? oh, here we go. Um, considering fatal and non-fatal outcomes together, dengue was responsible for 1.14 million disability-adjusted life years in 2013. Wow. Oh. Okay. And disability adjusted life years is pretty much what it sounds like. It's it's a, a statistic used in mm-hmm. public health analyses like this. Yeah, WHO uh, loves that number. Yeah, and it's a it, well, it's a it's an important figure to provide a reference point. So you can say this disease causes right. you know people to lose this many years of sure. their estimated lifespan and to have disability restrict their their working capability. So this is this is pretty significant. So putting it in context then, what is that in relationship let's say to yellow fever, to malaria, to you know uh, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, where does dengue come in on that scale? I'm I'm sure there's that data is out there someplace. Yes, and I'm trying to pull those I, numbers you know, up. Now. I've I've seen this and I can't recall it myself. By the way, wouldn't dare. Do WHO it. said the other day that they did not recommend uh-huh. the use of dengvaxia in international immunization programs. You're asking tough questions, Dixon. Well, yes, you are. <laughs> Sorry, those are the only ones I know. <laughs> nah, that's not true. <laughs> okay, dailies, dailies attributable to yellow fever, uh, chikungunya, Japanese encephalitis, and Rift Valley fever. Um, Estimated to fall between 300,000 and 5 million right. for 2005. And a lot of the noise here is because a lot of the places that suffer disproportionately from these diseases, the data are very poor. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that was my other question about the, the, um, the vaccinated group and the unvaccinated groups that come into the hospital in this vaccine trial. There are other things that cause fever that don't fit the, of course. the definition, right? So you... you what is the uh, yeah one of the uh, they they talk about uh, virologically concer- uh, con- confirmed hospitalization. So when they do the trials, right, right. they're okay. they're sure okay. that what you came in with was dengue. That's right. Because when that mosquito goes up, all, all the others go up too. Usually, and right. then you've got malaria and yellow fever and all this other stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, um, it's a mess. <laughs> Halstead concludes the substitution of yellow fever non structural proteins for those of dengue virus may have crippled dengvaxia protective T cell responses to dengue infections. Interesting. So, what can we do? Well, uh, TV003 right. um, is it being developed at NIH, and we talked about that on a previous TWIV. This is right. all dengue. It's a dengue virus lacking some. Bases from the three prime non coding region, which have been removed by modifying an infectious DNA clone. Mm. The virus is attenuated. It's been used in a challenge trial in humans. 
they infected, they gave this vaccine candidate to humans and then challenged them with a dengue type 2, which is attenuated so they don't get too sick, and 100% protection, sterile, sterilizing immunity. So there shouldn't be any severe dengue because it apparently it's completely protective. And if that ever came to be licensed, then I would predict that that would replace dengue vaccine. So right? the, with the lack of an animal model here, I mean, this is driving me crazy thinking about this. If you were to have four separate dengue vaccines, <gasps> don't put them together. Why? Four Why separate. And, which, cause, and then you can tell which ones cause the most severe reactions. Yeah, I know, but then you're going to make kids Now, when I know you can't do that. I said can't that lack it. of an animal model, this can't be done. But you wish you could do it because... You know, you vaccine with strain number one, let's put it this way. And then the next year, you vaccinate with strain number two. Does that induce disease? Well, it shouldn't induce disease if it's a vaccine. Well, it, Otherwise, it, it's a really bad vaccine. No, I know, Alan, but you, you already stated that being vaccinated is equivalent to having been infected with that strain. Well, not exactly. Uh, it's, you it's immunologically, work. it's immu- yeah, that's what so I mean. the argument from the epidemiology that Halstead is making is that the immunization is priming these kids to be more susceptible of to course. serious dengue. No, no, I got um, so if you came at them with a second vaccine, the yes. second vaccine should not infect them and cause disease. Otherwise, that's a defective vaccine. But it'll elicit antibodies. That's right. why I didn't question, say you won't get an infection. I got it. I got it. Well, but, yeah, but it. yeah, so eliciting antibodies is still then your end point. If Halstead is right that you need T cell immunity in no, addition, no, no. Yeah. Well, um, right. then that's an additional level you need to go to. Yeah. Yeah. So let's revisit this idea of correlates of protection. Yeah, there you right. go. If Halstead, if Halstead is right, then the antibody response is not an appropriate measure, is not an appropriate correlate of protection. Right. You well, can measure antibodies all day, and it, it you don't necessarily vaccine, predict right? whether or not they're the protected. antibodies. The antibodies may be one correlate of protection, Ex- exactly. Or but, at least you, you can, responded to the vaccine, but no, well, they're not. Well, it they're not that, to, it's not totally predictive. Right? It may be that you need antibodies to prevent um, infection, but if severe disease is prevented mainly by cytotoxic or. T lymphocytes say. Right. Yeah, right. my guess is you need both arms of the immune response yeah. to get to get real Complete protection. protection. Yep. Right yep. And, so, and I want to come back to this term sterilizing immunity mm-hmm. and see if I understand that. My, my interpretation of that is that basically the virus gets neutralized on its way in. You you never really exactly. get an infection off the ground. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And that's good. That that way you're not going to develop serious ADE. Right. Right. If virus can't replicate, that's it. You're stuck. But there's a distinction between sterilizing immunity and 100% efficacy. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that happens to be in this in this Right, trial. so ster- sterilizing immunity means that the you did the, the molecular analysis and you found that the virus never establishes right. an infection. That's right. Um, 100% efficacy means you give the vaccine and 100% of the people who receive it Don't are protected it. from yeah. subsequent infection. Uh, but you know, maybe the virus gets in and starts to replicate and then gets wiped out. So they don't have sterilizing yeah, sure. immunity, but they you have a very effective vaccine. I think in this trial, it turned out that we had both. You had both, right. Yeah, I think so, yeah. All right, so uh, that's... Curious or incurious. that. And we have... Uh, so I think you could stop using Dengvaxia. You could immunize older kids or you could do serology first. Right. And you no, know, now with rapid... Card based uh, antibody assays, you can probably do that uh, even in challenged areas, right? I was looking yes. up, and a number of people have made interesting ELISA based rapid diagnostic tests, which, yeah. so it's not as bad as it sounds, you know. No, no. And it's good technology. I mean, stop using it altogether. Yeah, that would protect against this this problem, but the reason for developing this in the first place and the reason um, the Philippines and Mexico uh, started using it, and I believe other countries were looking at it as well. Um, I think Brazil yeah. has started using it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, the, the whole rationale there is that this is beneficial. It, it attacks that million plus disability just in life years problem of dengue in your population causing severe disease. So if you add this stipulation that you only give it to kids who've been exposed um, previously and you add a, a simple serology test, then you could get the benefit without the downside. Yep. 
Well, it's up to individual countries to do as yep. they wish. By the way, uh, I think in the long run, you know, we're going to need a, a better vaccine like this. Yes. Hopefully, TV 003. Hopefully, that'll. TV 003. You got it. Um, by the way, uh, Jeff Almond worked at Sanofi for many years on this vaccine. And I know Jeff because <clears throat> he worked on polio virus for many years, and I knew him from that field. And he, he uh, went to industry. He was in um, at University of Leicester in the UK, and then he moved to Sanofi. I believe he's now retired, but and he's he's at Oxford in some visiting uh, position. But he, I interviewed him. That's what all this is leading to. So <laughs> I'm going to put a link in the show notes. Interviewed him at Manchester a number of years ago, and he talked about this particular vaccine. We talked about the issues with type two and all that. So perhaps you should interview Scott Halstead too. I would like to do that. I'm sure yeah. he would we love would, it. We would like to do that. He yeah. would love it. He would. He love He would it. love it. You think? Yeah, sure he would. Love it or leave it. No, he loves it. <laughs> He'd love it. Yeah, he's not far away. Nope. And we could get him on the Skype. Yeah. Okay. Very Anything well. else before we move on? Did nope. we do justice to this issue? I think so. Mm-hmm. I think so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, let's do a few emails here. First one. Now, we got a lot of responses to the career (laughs) question, so I figured let's read one per episode so it doesn't subsume everything else. First one here is from Andy, who writes, Hi, Twiverinos. As someone who recently received a PhD in microbiology and who often receives remarks from peers and PIs praising me for the sheer amount of work I have produced in my time in grad school, I could not disagree more strongly with the notion set forth by John Udell that you have to work insane hours to be successful. Not only do I find his claims lacking in scientific merit, as decades of psychology research show precisely the opposite of what he claims, but I find his general message absolutely toxic and detrimental to future scientists. PIs who put enormous pressure on their students and postdocs to work long hours, in my experience, are fast tracking them for stress, anxiety, burnout, other mental health issues, and a quick career change. My own experience aligns very well with recent and historical research on the relationship between productivity, creativity, motivation, and hours worked. I've spent on average about three to six hours per day doing very focused lab work. When I'm in the lab, I have a set plan. I do not do anything other than experiments. Work on multiple projects simultaneously, two to four, so all downtime steps from one project are spent doing lab work for another. While there are certainly days that I have spent 10 hours in the lab, they are the exception. I do constantly read the literature, but this is at most an hour or two a day and on average far less. Like Dixon says, I do have days when I'm obsessed with something and it occupies occupies my thoughts all day and night. But again, this is the exception. I get seven to eight hours of sleep every day almost without fail. Boy, am I envious of that. (laughs) While Udell claims that data showing diminishing returns from extra work hours may only apply to factory work and not creative work, this flies in the face of the evidence. A famous example is Charles Darwin, who only spent an average of four hours per day doing focused work, despite being a prolific writer of more than 19 books, which obviously had extensive creative merit. Same trend is repeated throughout history, and the research on the subject is summarized nicely in the book Rest, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less by Alex Pang. Remember, Darwin had 10 children, too, so he had to make some time for that as well. (laughs) I think a key trait for being successful is not how long you work, but how smart you work. I find many PIs do not spend enough time thinking about the risk-to-reward ratio of different projects. If a project has high uncertainty or is even likely to fail, especially if it has only modest potential for reward, spending 70 hours a week on it is a waste of time. Giving such a project to a new grad student or postdoc as their sole task is irresponsible and damaging, and yet I see it happen time and again. Knowing when to cut your losses is very important. High-risk, high-reward projects are often very exciting and sometimes lead to important discoveries, but to focus extensively on such a project is to gamble with your career and sanity. John Church summarized this nicely in an interview on Reddit when asked about the factors critical for his lab's extensive success. Maybe he means George Church, because he's very successful. He cites the following, an environment in which we we can fail fast, analyze, and try again. Teams of three people, two projects per person, one full of passion and risk, a second which is safer, not due to mediocrity, but due to maturity of the project. Aim for radically open sharing and radical cost reduction. Finally, I also find the workaholic mentality espoused by Udell to be implicitly tinged with sexism. 
If you're putting in 60 to 70 hour work weeks to get an edge on your competitors while also having a family, this presupposes that you are delegating a lot of your home and family responsibilities to someone else. I find it unsurprising that it is a male scientist suggesting this, and I imagine this idea does nothing useful to help encourage prospective female scientists, though I'd love to hear what others think, especially those without a Y chromosome. (laughs) If you're curious, in my four and a half years in the lab, I've written five first author papers, and I'm working on finishing up another three. I'd be amazed if I work more than 40 hours a week. So yes, you can have a life, a family, and other hobbies and interests and be a successful researcher. My advice, don't worry about how much you're working, but instead focus on doing cool and interesting science. The best source of motivation comes from your own passion within, not by comparing yourself to other people. Well, then why did you tell us what you did? <laughs> it's 80. Fair That's enough. what you asked him to. <laughs> yes. he did. If you're, it's 80 F here in Arizona. <laughs> I'm still wearing a t-shirt and waiting to remember what cold weather is like. P.S. Thank you so much for everything you do. I love your podcast and I've gotten many other students, grad students, postdocs, and PIs listening. Yeah, I know we asked to, but, if you're not going to compare, then don't tell us oh, you know, what no, you're doing. No, no really. No, no. You. It, he says, somebody might, do not compare yourself, yet he's comparing himself. So I don't, He's not actually he's comparing not, himself. He's just telling us the facts of how he's, providing how he's the data. been able to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't buy it. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I don't buy it. Don't buy he's it. He's providing the data on his research output yep. working reasonable hours. He's comparing right. himself. Sorry. I, no, he's not. He is. I don't think I, I don't see the comparison. Yeah, it's right here. If you're curious, right here. No, he's just he's. There's no comparison. He's what just he telling his own data. Yeah, there's there's no comparison, Vincent. I think he's comparing himself, but it doesn't matter because the point is, first of all, does anyone work eighty hours? Even though Udell said it, I don't know. No one has has admitted to it so far, and it doesn't really. Hours don't really matter. No. It's productivity, like he says, right? Right. And don't compare yourself, Twiverinos. <laughs> well, uh, any thoughts good. on this letter? Uh, yes, thank you very much. It's a good letter. It's a nice letter. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, John Church. Alan, can you take the next one? Okay, Brandon writes, Hello, Twiv. My name is Brandon. I'm from Fresno, California. I am also a sophomore in community college. As of a few days ago, I have applied to transfer to a four-year university. I'm hoping for the University of California in San Diego or University of California in Berkeley, but who knows? I may end up at Davis. <laughs> In my first semester of community college, my cell biology professor, Dr. Stephanie Kaufman, introduced my class and I to your podcasts, and I'm very grateful for that. I've learned a lot from your podcasts, especially about the world of academia. Now it's time to get to my question, because I could talk forever. <laughs> Since Hey, so could we. Since your recent TWIV episodes have been accentuating the dismal nature of academia, I've been rethinking my education and career aspirations. For a while now, I've been pre-med and have been taking the appropriate prerequisites, but after getting involved in a couple of student research projects and listening to TWIV, I've seriously begun to contemplate obtaining a PhD and going into research in hopes of becoming a PI. Essentially, I would love to hear everyone's thought on MD versus PhD. Oh, good. (laughs) Also, (laughs) could you all elaborate on why academic journals are so expensive? Oh, good. (laughs) To me, it appears... Alan can talk more than forever. (laughs) Oh, boy. Uh, Charging the public for scientific knowledge is criminal. Knowledge should be free and open to everyone. Also, who decided to give nature and sell a monopoly? We did. Yes. And one last question, if you don't mind. I self-identify as gay, and I'm wondering what the political climate is like in science. Do you guys and girls work with many openly gay professionals? Is science a safe career to be open about your sexual orientation? P.S. I'm a first-generation college student, so more or less, college is extremely enigmatic to me. Therefore, this is me trying to figure it out because my parents don't even know what a bachelor's degree is. Thank you for reading this long and convoluted email. Warm regards, Brandon, a kid who loves science but has a passion for writing and has no idea what he would like to do with his life. This is great. Brandon, you came to the right place. So, (laughs) wow. Let's start with MD versus PhD. Couldn't we just go to the picks of the week? (laughs) (laughs) No. We'll spend another hour on this and we'll go to the picks. Exactly. Um, Exactly. As as somebody who got a PhD and married an MD, um, I kind of see both sides of this with a PhD you can do a lot of things but there is no one career track that is going to guarantee you a job Um, as you've heard us talk about the the PI career track which is primarily what PhD programs have traditionally focused on producing even though for many many years only a minority of their graduates will actually pursue that um, 
that's a very hard job to get. And it's something that you certainly would be exposed to if you pursue the PhD. Um, just bear in mind and be realistic about your uh, your career prospects. There's a lot of other stuff you can do. I'm a science journalist. I know a number of patent attorneys. I know people who are uh, in essentially administrative roles in pharmaceutical companies, people who work for the government, people who work for um, – you know, who manage grants for universities. There's a tremendous diversity of jobs you can hold with that. Some of the same goes for an MD. The upside to an MD is that you are very, very highly employable, especially if you get outside a major city. Um, you know, some places like Boston and New York have a vast oversupply of physicians, but if you get out into the sticks of Western Massachusetts or upstate New York or, and not even very far, um, you will suddenly find that there are lots and lots of jobs for MDs and they pay quite well considering the, the relative cost of living in those areas. Um, so that's something to consider. And financially in the short term, of course, getting an MD is going to cost you a lot of money and you're probably going to go into debt. Um I used to be able to say that getting a PhD, you would be able to, um, you know, to live at least through graduate school without incurring additional debt. I don't think that's going to be the case much longer. So you may want to reevaluate that as well. Just get both. You can do an MD PhD program. And then, then they pay for your tuition, right, Dixon? This is very true. Mm. And then philosophically, there are very different kinds very. of things that you do in each of these. And so, if you want to consider being an MD, you should probably do some shadowing. If you want to do a PhD, you should probably volunteer to, as Rich says, start out as a dishwasher in somebody's lab and check out what lab work is like. I finally got a chance to see what medical school classes were when I moved to Michigan. So this is well into my career. And I went to the small groups for infectious disease and the basic scientist in those classes was basically the slide projectionist <laughs> um, and then we did a little bit of uh, hands-on help with some lab exercises at the end for these medical students and I found the work that was going on in those infectious disease small group classes to be just uh, intensely boring um, so, you know, they talked about here we looked at this x-ray and what are the possible bacteria and then what are the drugs? And it was seemed to be rote memorization and, yes, a little bit of critical thinking. But I kind of said to myself, boy, am I glad I did not go to medical school. But <laughs> you should you should probably check out some medical school classes if you can and and see what those are like, if that's the kind of – information input that you like and then how that's going to pan out you can do the shadowing and uh, i think these the, are, the, sh go, the go shadowing is is really uh important advice yes. i served on the uh as as dixon has and maybe some of you others as well i served on the uh medical selection committee that is the admissions committee for medical school uh for for years and um uh the 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 students who were successful uh, and who made the biggest impression were those that you could confidently say from their uh, experience going into this, knew what they were getting into and that they were passionate about uh, caring for patients. Right. Um, and I think if, if that's not, if that's not your passion, yeah. it's not going to, it's not going to be enough. Cause as Kathy says, some of the material can be pretty boring, much the same as a PhD. If you work in a laboratory and you find you're passionate about uh, working at the working at the bench, uh, great. But if you don't find that passion, it's just moving small amounts of colorless fluids from one tube to another in a really really boring process. <laughs> and, and these are very these are actually different ways of looking at the world. By the way, that's right. When, and <clears throat> yes, there are MD PhD programs, but everybody I know who's been through one ends up ultimately becoming what I would consider an MD or a PhD. Mm -hmm. And there are people who do an MD and end up thinking like PhDs. Uh, and we've had some of them on the show. But um, even if they still treat patients, <laughs> they end up thinking more like scientists. There's um, in science, 
we're all about the curiosity and taking the system apart and figuring out how it works. In medicine, you are treating people. And it's a one-to-one thing, and it's very much about getting the best answer within the time frame that you have allotted and getting this person better. And so there's a yeah, I, I frequently have conversations with my wife where we'll we'll be talking about some phenomenon and and I'll say, but what's really cool is this, and she'll say, No, that's not interesting at all. <laughs> no, I, uh, you already know how to treat the patient. Why do you care about the rest of the story, right? <laughs> so. Most biological, you're right on target here, um, Brandon. Uh, most biological scientists I know have uh, dealt with exactly this uh, question at exactly yes. your stage uh, of education. I myself did. And uh, one of the things that I did was I wrote a letter to my uh, uncle. Now, this is a generation ago, so it may not be relevant. Uh, as relevant or differently relevant now. But at any rate, it's my experience. I wrote a letter to my uncle who was an MD, PhD, uh, and an MD of uh, significant uh, repute. And he uh, he wrote me back this long thing that was great. He says, if you feel like this, yada, 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 go to medical school. If you feel like this, yada, 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 go to uh, graduate school. If you feel like this, yada, 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 get a combined degree. And if after all this, you still don't know what to do, get the PhD first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, and if after you're done with that, you, you think you still want to go back and get an MD, do that. So that's what I did. Mm-hmm. And it was the right thing for me. I would have made a crappy doctor and, uh, and I really love the bench work. All right. How about academic journals? Academic journals. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they so expensive? Can you they do can it in be. 20 words or less? <laughs> because they like, can tweet be. it, tweet your answer. <laughs> they they charge they charge what the market will bear, mm-hmm. and why does the market bear that? P- beats the hell out of me. So there but, was, well, a link. It's, was it's it last week like, or the week before that uh, had that article that described the history of yes mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. that I think is a really good read. Uh, yes. Maybe you want to put that link in again for Brandon, um, because that does kind of explain how they got to be expensive. So I think. by exp- how much are these journals? Let's throw out some. How much is science a year? I subscribe to it. Um, is it $250 a year? That's less than that. Oh no. I don't think so. Well, I don't think I pay more than that. We'll find out. <laughs> science, nature, cell, how much do they cost? Cuz I know ASM journals are not that expensive, right? But they're right. still not as cheap as Time magazine, right? No. <laughs> No, I well, uh, the ACS has a series of. I'm, I'm a, still a member of ACS, and oh right, um, okay. <clears throat> so for uh, personal subscription, you're right, Dixon. One forty nine for a member, seventy five for a student. Thank you. Personal subscription for one year of Nature is one ninety nine, yeah. but the institutions end up paying a lot. A they big do, difference. and that's why the journals cost cost so much because they they don't care about the individual subscribers; they care about library subscriptions. And if you want if you want access to the Elsevier family of journals, oh, forget it. Um, your library, because you're not going to do this personally, but your your library is going to be paying tens of thousands That's right. minimum That's right. to get a package. And they negotiate each of these packages individually yeah. with each institutional library. That's true. And there is a stipulation that the librarian has to sign when they're getting this deal that they will not disclose how much they are paying. For what they're getting. <laughs> So there's a non-disclosure built in that prevents information reaching the market wow. that would allow people to negotiate the rates down. Yeah. So it is it is a real smoke-filled room here. I mean, it's just... Uh, we have a, a good service here, and I'm sure everybody at a major university has the same service. Uh, you get these journals free. All you have to do is go online for them. Okay? Yeah, you, you personally do not pay for them. Not is what all. you mean. They're not yeah, free. No, no, no. They're, Animal, yeah. You know what I meant. But the faculty get it free. The university ends up paying for it, and they take that money out of your overhead to pay for it. So that, right. in other words, you did pay for it. Yes. But, but not in the painful way of paying for it. <laughs> not this, out of your own This pocket. notion that scientific knowledge should be free is the whole open science yeah, sure, movement. Sure, that's, sure, um, sure. that's a thing. Yeah. Well, then, Why, uh, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I don't have anything more to add to that. Who, uh, who decided to give nature and sell a monopoly? We did. The scientists yeah. do because we think that it's great. We overvalued them. We yeah, overvalued. we overvalued so, it. 
So here, a uh, personal subscription to virology is now $950. Oh, and whoa. an institutional subscription is $9,500. Oh, this is criminal. Bingo. For one journal. And who makes that journal? Elsevier. Elsevier. That's Elsevier. Elsevier. Yeah. And that's that's the published rate. Now, if you're actually an institutional library, you, cut a you, deal, would, right? call, you would call up Elsevier. You have to you cut say, a deal. We need to have these 30 journals in our library, and right. they would quote you a rate for your particular case. Correct. Hmm. Wow, we have to do something about this. We do. Yeah. Do we have access through the National uh, Medical Library of all these journals? Well, the things that are in, uh, yeah, they're all there. All Med Central, they're all there. Yeah. Well, so, if right. the person was funded by federal dollars and then has to put their paper in PubMed Central, yeah. PubMed right. is free to the public, right? PubMed, yeah. yes. So the, some of these do become open access um, after some period, period of time. Right? Some yeah. period of time yeah. post publication. Yeah. I think it's currently six months for federally federally funded. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's um, right. But of course, if you want to keep up with the current yeah, exactly. science, exactly. you need access sooner than six months. Yeah, it is loopholes. useful for looking at historical papers when you look something up on PubMed and it says open access version available or you know yeah, yeah. free full text on. Um, uh, right. Just click the link there. But it, uh, yes, so this is this is the situation. Dixon, if you didn't come in here to to the office, could you get journals at home? No. No. What are you going to do? I come here. <laughs> well, but you could probably get Columbia VPN as an emeritus professor, right? Well, I get do. In. You know, I think I could. I think there's a code that I have to type out in order to get it at home. Right. And Steve right. Goffis told me about it, but I, you know, I don't do that right. because I work here. I come in to go to work. I come in right. to, there go you go. to work. Right. Mm-hmm. To Let's think. move to Brandon's last question mm-hmm. about yes. self-identifying as gay and what's it like? Is it science a safe career to be open about your sexual orientation? So, do we work with many openly gay professionals? I certainly know of several. Mm. Uh, I know of several. Mm-hmm. More than several, yeah, I would sure. say. If yeah, I start thinking sure. about other departments and yeah, so yeah. on. Yeah. No, it's, I, I, we hire gay people here. We have in all departments here. And I, so I have never seen an issue. No, I haven't. Um, nope. I don't, I'm not sure. That being said, we can't really address how safe it is to be open from the standpoint of somebody who has done that. So right. yeah. take that with a grain of salt. I think the atmosphere has gotten much more uh, tolerant over the last 20 years than it was uh, in the days that, let's say, when I was a, a postdoc at Rockefeller. That was more um, than 20 years, Dick. Yeah, I, much more than 20 <laughs> years ago. That's true. Uh, there were people 20 then. Years ago, 20 years ago, I was in graduate school. <laughs> sure. No, no, I didn't mean 20. I'll make it 40 years ago. <laughs> you know, 1967, how's I just put the date on it. And uh, there was a, a person at Rockefeller University who – came out as a gay person and it was a shock to all the faculty. Everybody was in, in, uh, up in arms about it. And what are we going to do about this person? And he started to dye his hair and he did all kinds of things to uh, make himself stand out in a crowd, so to speak. And um, his name was Bruce Veller. His name was Bruce Veller. And um, not that he kept a secret of that at all. Uh, and later on became quite uh, – not just tolerated, accepted. They 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 go okay, fine. We've got a gay person. I'm like, oh, the hell with it. You know, I knew him before he said he was. So why don't we just talk to him the way we were talking to him before? Yep. And it didn't matter. I mean, the, the guy wasn't a, a predator or anything like this, so it was fine. Absolutely. Let's do a couple more while Rich is rebooting. His power went out again. <laughs> right. Um, Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Kimberly writes, Dear Twiv Crew, writing from San Diego where the weather is a clear but frigid 13 degrees C, 57 degrees Fahrenheit, humidity 72%. Is, are there reasons for influenza activity being so high in Louisiana at the moment? I always love the show and how most excellently vaccines are supported. Thanks. And she's an MD in the children's medical group. Hmm. So... Influenza activity being high in Louisiana at the moment. Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. It's particularly there's a nice map over at CDC. Interesting. Um, I you know I don't know of any particular reason other than every year you have some states that are higher than others. Um, you know, it's actually shaping up to be kind of a bad flu season. Yeah. Um, current trends 
and I'm not sure if it's on this page. Yeah, uh, they have they have hospitalization. Oh yeah, they've got a seasonal baseline, and um, yes, current current trend is for for a pretty pretty robust season. The vaccine is not a great match for yeah. uh, at least one of the serotypes, and um, the based on the southern hemisphere experience from their flu season um it oh, could wow. be it Maybe. could be a bad one sorry about that no yeah, there's one mismatch the h3n2 the others are, right. are matched and so you might you should get it i heard today that less than half of the uh, u.s gets flu vaccine we did it you and i, I yeah yep. yeah everybody on this, in my family on this show probably <laughs> let's see kathy did you get a flu vaccine of course and rich condit did you yeah, I got flu block. 100%. Bingo. Hey, you got the right one because it, an insect says it has the glycosylation site. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's just great. Yeah. So I don't think there's any particular reason for Louisiana other than just randomness, but there might be, you know, Mississippi next door is also high and South Carolina. And this wonderful map at the CDC, you can mouse over each state and see the level. Um, and then you can click on the state and go to their local website and go right to the Louisiana Department of Health and see their weekly report. Yeah. It's really cool. Mm. And then you can click on influenza activity remains high. Majority of positive specimens are H3N2, which of course is not well protected by the vaccine this year. <laughs> <laughs> Try again next year. <laughs> oh, well. It is still better to get the vaccine than of course. not. Absolutely. It certainly is. Rich Condit uh, yeah. Can you take the next one? This is uh, Mikhail. Yeah, he was, uh, Mikhail was um, part of the book contest. Right, number 18. Yes. <laughs> number 18. Hello, TWIV crew. It is my second time writing to TWIV. I'm a regular listener, subscriber, and a patron. Thank you. It is time to start participating in the book giveaways. Also, <laughs> here's my two cents regarding a few topics covered in recent episodes. One, borscht is a traditional Ukrainian and Russian soup that is not served cold. Boy, we cover the whole gamut here. We yes, do. we do. We do. <laughs> Instead, it is served hot. It is made of beef stock, cabbage, beets, potatoes, onions, carrots, and sometimes beans added. Wow. In Ukrainian tradition, it is served with uh, uh, galushki. Mm. small dumplings mm -hmm. in Russian cuisine. Galushki are not necessary, but borscht is always served with sour cream, cold beet soup that Amy referred to may be the cold beet soup also called, uh, Sve uh, Svekolnik, uh, literally from beets. It is usually vegetarian. However, ham may be added to the mix. It's a great dish on a hot summer day, usually served with sour cream as well. Mm -hmm. Two, the funding oh, wait, situation. before you leave Borscht, yep. um, sometimes, uh, at least when I was in Russia and Ukraine, I noticed that it was pronounced more with a T. So Correct. Well, that's what I thought. Borscht or Borscht, either way. That's okay. Borscht. Uh, two, the funding situation that was not in the postdoc years of Dr. Udell and the current state of affairs are quite different. Oh, the, uh, sorry. The funding situation that was in the postdoc years of Dr. Udell and the current state of affairs are quite different. While I understand the talk about passion for love of science, 80 hours a week effort, et cetera, these words are hardly compelling for someone whose salary is not sufficient to support a family. <laughs> I'm not even talking about the challenges that, a for, that foreign postdocs are facing, from cultural shock to the power over a postdoc that H-1B visa gives the PI. Also, the idea uh, to practically abandon your family in order to succeed in science is preposterous to me. I very much agree with Dr. Dove that the current system has failed and people uh, who have power to change it are the ones that benefit from the current situation. Three, in the most recent episode, you discussed the letter from Rahan about the challenges he faces in his scientific career. 
I don't like to talk about myself, but have to use my personal experience as an example. I was not ready for the intensity, competitiveness, and pace of the scientific endeavor in the U.S. At some point, I had to admit that I am not suited to become a research faculty here. This actually was a liberating experience. I realized what I do best, teaching, and pursued this path. The result, I teach now at, at the community college, and I love it. And there are always opportunities for small research collaborations if you really want them. All in all, self-criticism and sober and honest self-evaluation are critically important for the timely career decisions. Not everyone is suited to be a scientist, and it's okay. Loving science is just not enough. There are components of luck, mentoring, etc. that also play a role. For instance, I love running but will never be a marathon uh, never run a marathon in under 3 hours. I can still enjoy it too though. Thank you all for your podcast. They're entertaining, thought provoking and help me to stay on top of the game. I teach mainly microbiology. With kind regards, Mikhail, that is Mike, uh, who's an assistant uh, professor at the Department of Biology in Lakeland Community College. Hmm. I Which like this. Self-criticism must... and sober and honest self-evaluation are critically important. That's perfect. Yeah, this is a very nice letter. Perfect. Even yeah. the borscht. Yes, and <laughs> Kathy had an addendum about the borscht. You well, I said I wasn't going to make a deal of it, but in, in Wikipedia, I think we should. it does say that it may be served either hot or cold. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it's such a widespread thing. It can be vegetarian or meat or fish. Um, I tried to try it every place I was in... Russia and Ukraine when I was there, and it was always different. Just like gazpacho is different every place in Spain. So, yeah. okay, take that last one. It's very long, Dixon. I will. I will give it my best shot. Scott writes, "Hello again, Twiv team. You may not remember, but I wrote in a year from, and then it gives a reference to Scott and at Columbia Columbus State dot edu." <clears throat> so he, he wrote us from there uh, ago, expressing my fandom. It's an email address. It is an email address. <laughs> yes, that's right. I knew that. Uh, <laughs> fandom and telling of my woes and trying to get into graduate school. I was very disheartened with the rejection I had received those months previously. But y'all gave wonderful words of encouragement. And I'm happy to say that I'm finishing my PhD applications as we speak. In all honesty, I was very close to reassigning myself from resigning myself from the PhD hunt. I felt it was quite a tall feat, one which I had already ruined my chances of com- competing, primarily due to my low undergrad GPA. I have now been employed as a research microbiologist for nearly two years and even run my own micro lab now. With this experience, along with some coding in R, <clears throat> my genomics experience and my high MS GPA, I'm cautiously optimistic for my chances this round. In my last email, I explained that it was because of your podcast that I decided to make the transition from genomics to virology. While writing, <clears throat> when writing, I didn't expect to get much warm advice and words of encouragement. I have been waiting for a good opportunity to write again and express my thanks. And I think this book opportunity fell at the right time to give me the kick I needed. <laughs> this email falls in the myriad signing. No, no. This email falls in with the myriad singing the praises of TWIV. It is a wonderful podcast and a true gift to science. You make virology more accessible than I would have thought possible, and I still tell everybody <coughs> that will in- listen all about TWIV. On a separate note, I really love the picks of the week. They are the primary way I get new talking points with which to annoy my wife. <coughs> in prints, not because they aren't interesting, but because I won't shut up. <laughs> Close prints. I have read E.O. Wilson's letters to a young scientist and think it was a fabulous book. It is not only pertinent to starting scientists to answer Vincent's question about its relevance. My favorite chapter of the book discusses the categories of thought within which scientists typically find meaning. It's truly fascinating. I have also... I also have my own listener pick to add, and it may have been mentioned already, but a search of the TWIV page didn't bring anything up, so here it is. In quotes, Why Vaccines Matter by Cynthia Gorney. It was featured in the November issue of the National Geographic. I thought it was a very good piece that illustrates the issues that so many in first world countries seem to have forgotten. 
Uh, link is given at the bottom. <clears throat> if I was awarded a second listener pick, maybe to make up for the one that I didn't give last time, I would suggest The Song of the Dodo by David Quammen. Quammen. I know Spillover was already suggested, <clears throat> but The Song of the Dodo was the first book I read of his, and I think it is a great book. The book is about community, ecology, island biogeographic theory, and extinction events. I think these theories are very pertinent to virology and the study of human microbial flora, for each person acts as an island of isolated individuals with random interchanges of microbes from one island to another. Thank you again for all your hard work. Okay. Excellent. Nice letter, Scott. So good luck on your uh, good luck with your PhD application. Sounds Excellent. like you've done all the right stuff. Sounds like you're going to get in too. Scott's a senior research scientist at HPPE LLC. HPPE. No way that's going to turn up in a Google. Might. Sure it will. Be surprised. HPPE. Yeah, here it is. It's a chemicals company founded in 2012. Interesting. Performance product engineering. There you go. Oh. There you go. What was his name? Scott? Scott. Mm -hmm. Columbus, Georgia. Yeah. I wrote from Columbus State before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that will do it. Let's do some picks. Here we go. Dixon, do you have a pick? I do. Thank yes, you. Yes, I, I get this pick from an uh, uh, something that popped up on my uh, search engine uh, with regards to a uh, visual imaging, imaging. And this is a uh, a contest, I think, that was held in Australia in the neurosciences for the best images and these are incredible. If you want to see what your brain looks like in color, take a look at these pictures. They're just unbelievable. <laughs> I'm so Gorgeous. attracted to these things. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's how you can make science beautiful. I'm happy and that you don't have a Cosmos link again. No, I wouldn't do that to you people. Not They're from the Queensland <laughs> Brain Institute, and one of them is C. Yeah. Uh, Elegant spelling out QBI. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> In rainbow colors. Yep. It's really yep. beautiful. No, it's it's amazing how far we've come in expressing the um, the nuance of the beauty of the way we're constructed. And I think Oh, these, they're gorgeous. Yeah, they're all yeah, these really are pretty. fabulous. Dixon, what if I wanted to see my brain in black and white? I think that you would be uh, relegated to the corner with a dunce cap on. Look at the astrocyte. <laughs> the astrocyte is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, wow. they're, <laughs> they're in, almost indescribable, but uh, – mm. It's what we are. We're looking at ourselves when we look at this and saying how beautiful How did you are. find this, Dixon? Like I said, it was a random – I was searching for something else, and I ran across this, cool. and I Very clicked nice. it, and there it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Alan, what do you have? Um, I have something that I'm hoping uh, scientists listening to the show will add themselves to. Uh, this is called diversesources.org. Um, somebody on Twitter alerted me to it, and this is a um, – it's a project to collect scientists who um, uh, are willing to talk to the media and who are ideally not from um, the standard uh, white male background because um, that's who we mostly end up quoting uh, in, in articles because that's who's easy to find. They're high profile. Mm -hmm. uh, but, of course, there are a lot of folks who don't match that d description who are out there who are maybe not um, – not self-promotional enough to show up at the top of the Google page. Uh, and this is a, a resource for journalists. So science journalists should obviously tune into it, but, uh, really I'm hoping that listeners of the show will look at it and maybe click the join button up at the top so that next time I'm working on an article and I type in some specialty, I'll be able to come up with a good list of sources off this. <laughs> Kathy, cool. did you, uh, did you click the about, uh, tab on this link yeah i didn't yeah uh, do it do, do it. it do it do oh that. yes definitely cool <laughs> yes she's sitting right here on my computer mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> kathy you should on it. you should yeah. also click the join tab because yeah. i searched okay. virology and i did not find you so okay hmm. didn't know about it until now <laughs> in fact virology i think let me is there any like, repeat There's this one on the front page yeah a virology returns a single hit Valentina Alarcon at the Broad. Yeah, that's the one I saw on the first page, yeah. yeah. Rich Condit, what do you have? So uh, I've uh, decided in my retirement that I have lots of time to read, so you're going to get a lot of books. Uh, I just right. finished Moneyball. 
by, oh, by sure, Lewis, sure. Um, which may not sound like a science pick, but it is no, because no. Uh, what this is about is the uh, early 2000s Oakland A's uh, where Billy Bean was the general manager and uh, they were a low budget team and he was forced to find new ways of looking at the game and fell in with a Harvard graduate who was a um, an economics uh, major. And so this is kind of freakonomics applied to baseball exactly. and found all sorts of new ways to analyze the uh, statistics of baseball that all of the traditional scouts were ignoring completely. You know, the traditional scouting efforts were all kind of uh, subjective uh, criteria. They thought they were being objective, but they weren't uh, really. So he applied all these things and made a successful team. So I've got a link here to the book, which I would read first. There's also a film with Brad Pitt and and, cool. um, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. And the, the movie's good, too, but I would uh, I would start off uh, with with the book. It's uh, it's really fascinating. It's and it's well written, particularly good if you have, you know, enjoy baseball. So do they. So they won a lot of championships, right? Do, do, uh, they have not, not won many. the World Series. They, they have, have not, not won the World no. Series. They've made the playoffs a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, and Billy Beans, I, I love Billy Beans uh, <laughs> famous quote, which is, uh, you know, his goal is to win the last game of the season. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. They won uh, world championships in 89, 74, well, 73. Yes. Uh, a lot. They was, won nine. Was, yeah, but that was yeah. before yes. Moneyball. That was, oh, it was before, before? Billy Bean. Uh, yeah, I before see. Before Moneyball. Uh, and so this is still an ongoing thing. He he really, with right. this, uh, transformed uh, baseball. That's right. Uh, and I want to, hmm. well, I could, I could extend this uh, into an arc because basically <laughs> this guy – uh, defied the conventional wisdom. Um, and this is what it takes. It takes somebody who is willing to take a risk and go out there and say the conventional wisdom is not wise and do something. Um, and I think we ought to do the same thing with this cell science nature garbage. Like brain sections and Zika virus. <laughs> Very, so, very so do, do other teams now apply the the method? Yes, yes, they all yeah, do. and cool. and the original now that's guy, the conventional that, wisdom. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. I don't think that it's uh, yet quite the conventional wisdom, but quite a few teams have uh, have taken up with this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually it's very it, the analysis is very interesting. <laughs> He's he says, listen, the only the 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 bottom line statistic, the only thing that's really important is how many runs you score. Okay. <laughs> right. That's and so it's been the case. And so I thought what's pitching, important is not your batting average or anything like that. What's important is getting on base. And a lot of these strategies like sacrifice flies and bunts are nonsense because those are outs. And if you get outs, you're going <laughs> to uh, inhibit your chances of getting on base. It's very interesting. Yeah. Actually coming up with uh, statistics for pitching and uh, pitching. elements of defense are that are that are really useful and and easy to quantify are much more difficult. Yes. Okay, but the one that you can really deal with is how many runs you score. It's very interesting. So his teams never bunt. Nope. Don't bunt. Don't steal. Stealing is stupid. Yeah, but you're not always out on a steal, right? Depends on who's uh, <laughs> all you got to do is be out a few times. That's not good. Uh -huh. oh, well. Okay. You can, you can bunt for a base hit and not necessarily sacrifice though. Uh, right? Yes. Yes. So, so that's okay. That's okay. All right. The thing I've always found amusing about baseball is that every pitcher has a chart on every hitter that he's about to face and they review that the mm -hmm. day before. Sure. It's you have to still have to make the right pitch. I mean, you know where to throw. Well, of course, it. of course. But occasionally, you don't throw it in that place, catcher, and it goes over the fence. The catcher helps too. The catcher helps a lot. They studied the batters together. Yeah. But even though you know the weakness of a batter, I've, I mean, I've seen pitchers that throw three low curveballs, and the guy th swings at all three of them. Yeah, because they know that ball is rising at the end of the yeah. game. You can't do anything about. <laughs> exactly. it. I understand. Yes, yeah, that's so right. your salary yeah, will one, be lowering as your fastball is rising. <laughs> one of one of the points that. Uh, <laughs> that comes across in this is uh, walking is really important. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. People don't, people don't like to walk, but you know, you know, the, the, uh, the a batter's ability to wait, uh, wait for the right pitch True. and walk if he can is really important. Get be on a, base. To be a good walker, you have to be a great hitter. 
for for people who might not know baseball all that well, getting a walk means waiting, <laughs> and the pitcher makes four bad pitches, and then you get to walk to the first right. base. So you get on base without having swung your bat. That's that's very well said. <laughs> all right, <laughs> this is true. Kathy, what do you have? I picked something entitled "NASA is reinventing the wheel," and I it's love a this, pretty Kathy. cool this site. Is very neat. Yeah, so um, they talk about. Uh, the various wheels on starting with a Russian vehicle, a uh, moonwalker uh, vehicle, and how the oh, wheels oh yeah. have to be designed to go over rough terrain and the evolution of these different wheels over time. And then, uh, so they have the moon ones and then uh, things for Mars. And then they have a picture of Mars rover tire damage, which is yes. pretty impressive yeah. uh, f- on Curiosity. And uh, so then... They show you a picture of the test track where they're testing different kinds of tires and um, at uh, NASA's JPL. And then they have this interview with these guys, and it's sort of serendipity, but they had tried these uh, spring steel tires. And the problem is that they deform over when they meet these really sharp rocks. And so these two guys at NASA and one of them just happened to run into his buddy and and said, what are you doing now? And he took him into the lab and the and the visiting guy said, well, don't you have a problem with the I forget what the phrase was, but the those tires a shape memory problem. And the guy said, yeah, we do. And he said, well, I have the solution for you. And so it was just total serendipity that the visiting guy knew about nickel titanium, which is a shape memory alloy that can uh, overcome this problem of the tires deforming. And so there's several different videos and things that are just really cool. I love it, Kathy. This is great stuff. This is really neat. By the way, for you baseball fans out there that don't know what JPL is, it's the Jet Propulsion (laughs) Laboratory. (laughs) Yeah, and this this is a really, really neat problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. Of course, you can't just use conventional tires. You don't have any. I mean, you can't patch them. You can't reinflate them. You can't. All the stuff that we do routinely on Earth is just not going to be available when you're on Mars. And so you need to come up with tires that are going to last an all-terrain vehicle for long periods of time. Yeah. This uh, yeah. this guy this guy who uh, talks about the nickel titanium uh, alloy looks like somebody who would you you might find in a bar named Bubba. Okay. (laughs) And then all of this just really incredibly high tech engineering and molecular stuff comes out of his mouth. It's really great. Yeah. 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 So I suspect that those tracks on Mars that you think are so damaging will all be gone the first gigantic storm that they have on Mars because they have a lot of them. Uh, They'll just Mm. be obliterated. All right. I sent it to my, a friend of mine who's a material science engineer because I, I just think it's such a cool thing for his profession to get this kind of uh, publicity. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a story pick which is embodied in an article in a podcast. Ooh. The story is in Quanta magazine and the name is A Zombie Gene Protects Elephants from Cancer. And the, this is based on a bioarchive manuscript from Vinnie Lynch's lab at the University of Chicago. And he has addressed the question, why don't elephants and whales and big animals, why don't they have more cancer? They should. They have more cells, but they don't. Now, just to be clear here, they do get cancer. But so not don't as, everybody go out and try and buy elephant <laughs> cartilage or whatever the BS is. <laughs> they get cancer, but not as they much as you cancer, would think. Just like sharks do, but not as much as you Yeah, think. because... They should get a lot more because they have so many cells, but they don't. they're huge. And that's yeah. Pito's paradox, okay? So he found that elephant genome has a gene that was repurposed. It used to be dead. It used to be inactive, a pseudogene, and it evolved into an active gene, and that's where the zombie comes from. It came to life. And this gene protects against cancer because it's induced by P53, the tumor suppressor, P53 detects DNA damage, precursor to cancer. Uh, It induces this gene, which is called LIF6, and that kills the cell by apoptosis. So these elephants... So it's basically better surveillance of cells gone bad. Exactly. Right. 
And so that probably allowed them to get large, I would guess. Can but, this gene uh, be transfected into a mouse with high rates of cancer? That's exactly what lower? I asked him on the podcast, which is episode 26 of Twivo. We had him as the our answer, guest this week. He said mouse are not the right animal. They live too long. They're going to do it in zebra fish. Oh, I see. Huh. They're going to put this lift gene into zebra fish and see okay. if it affects their longevity. Yes, yeah, you so. could do it in mice too, just for the heck of it. No, you, you do don't. That. You have to. Uh, hey, as that guy said in this letter, you <laughs> have to plan your experiments. You have to pick the ones that are yes. likely to lowest give hanging you, fruit. What did he? What did he call it? Yeah. No, you can't just do that, Dixon. You can't you, just squander your lift. You can't squander <laughs> your postdoc or your student, Dixon. <laughs> anyway, uh, Vinny Lynch is very cool. We had two Vinnies on this episode. So the name of the episode is My Scientist Vinny. <laughs> Vinny Squared? Yeah, Kathy gets it. <laughs> yeah. You don't get it. Dick. I've seen that movie more it. times than you have. Okay. <laughs> Every time it comes on, I watch. I told you not to compare. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, check out the article. It's good. And uh, check out Twevo 26. Vinny Lynch has got a good sense of humor. He's from Piermont, New York, originally. That's where he grew up. Are you sure? What do you mean? Am I sure he told it's, me? That's a quote from Vinny, my cousin Vinny. Yeah, you meld. Are you sure? You meld. <laughs> and she says, I'm sure. I'm sure. Are you sure? <laughs> sure. Remember? It's a great. I love her yeah. in that. It's just fabulous. It's a, and Pesci was pretty good, too. They were all good. I saw, an, I saw an interview with her where she said that when she was growing up, her mother tried to get her to lose her Brooklyn accent. Oh, you know, no. Because uh, it. it was so toxic. But uh, <laughs> Oh, so we it can worked. all be glad she didn't. It, it worked, worked so movie. well. It sure did. Worked in that movie. All right. So then we had a listener pick from Scott, which you heard, yeah. Why Vaccines Matter and The Song of the Dodo by David Quammen. Yep. And that will do it for 471 Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash twiv. Questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. By the way, speaking of book contests, our winner has not responded. Oh, Real. Mm. So we, he's the one who wrote, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> so maybe we should re-randomize the well, list. We'll wait a bit. Another. We'll wait a bit. But if we don't have a response, which, you know, we'll, re, we'll re-randomize, yeah. He could could be out well, of, you, on vacation. Yeah, yeah. We'll give yeah, it. and you have his email address, right? No, but I think people need to listen to, to find out they're a winner. Well, yeah, that's true. We don't have any rules like that. I know that in a real contest, you got to inform the winners and all that. But we'll wait like a month. And we'll see how much of a fan he really is. <laughs> this is a test. Tough guy. <laughs> Microbe.tv slash contribute if you'd like to support our efforts. Dixon de Palmier, he's at thelivingriver.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com. You don't have to prompt me. I know what to say. You're making mouth motions. Thank you, Dixon. You're highly welcome. <laughs> highly welcome. <laughs> That's right. Highly good. <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at... The University of Michigan, which is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville and currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm glad the power didn't go out again. I'm glad it didn't go out again either. I was, <clears throat> that, was, that was shocking. The whole I'm sorry. House, I missed what I missed. The whole house well, it was not shocking. Went out. Everything, yep, <laughs> it was not shocking. <laughs> wow. And then it like came right back on, right? Yep. Yeah. Is all that surge? Isn't that great for your electronics? <laughs> uh, I'm glad. I'm glad nothing broke. As far as you know. As far as I know. Your refrigerator is now dead. Ugh. All your clocks have to be reset. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and he's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American. Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for his introductory music, ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>